Well, it's great to be back uh, on stage here in conversation with a global CEO who joins us here at the Rising Bharat Summit. Ryan, thank you so much for being here with us uh, at the summit. We truly appreciate your time here. I know that you're here in India on a very short visit, so it means a lot to us uh, that you've made time for us here. Uh, for the benefit of our audience here in this room, as well as those who are watching, just to give you a sense of the footprint that Visa occupies in FY23, the Visa Network enables enabled $15 trillion in total volume and 276 billion transactions. They operate across 200 countries and of course India is a strategic market for Visa and here's why outside of their home base which is the US, India is the second largest employee base for Visa. So Ryan, uh, uh, it, it's great to get your insights on why you're bullish on India and what gives you confidence about the India digital story. Uh, let's start with your visit to Mumbai. Uh, I believe you had quite the experience of using your digital payment system to buy some vada pao on the streets. <laughs> I did. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, looking forward to the discussion. Um, and it's been a great trip. This is my first trip back to India since uh, I assume my new role as CEO of the company. And there's so much happening here. And so I'm here to learn. Uh, when I was in Mumbai, I was meeting with our partners and our clients, big banks, small banks, fintechs, big techs. I met with our employees uh, who have lots of ideas on things that we can be doing better uh, to help them in the market. And I got out and walked around. Uh, sound boxes, QR codes, coffee shops, um, you know, they, they wanted me to experience what's really happening here so that when we're back helping the team here in India, we really understand it. It was, it was quite an experience. Did you expect it to be as smooth as it turned out to be? I had been told that it was smooth, but until you actually, you know, scan the QR code and see how quick it works and you hear the sound box and the words that come out of it and you see how that's helping the you know, person who's running the small, the small booth, um, it's very impressive. You know, speaking of impressive, uh, let's talk about the UPI moment in India, and that's been the big sort of event. Uh, uh, it's pre-UPI and post-UPI. That's how the digital payment network is being seen uh, in India. Do you see UPI as competition, or do you see UPI as a collaborator? Well, I, first let me say, I think what's happened with UPI in India is nothing short of remarkable. I think uh, it has uh, accelerated financial inclusion in this country by more than a decade. Um, the speed, the growth, the adoption, the user experiences that I was talking about, um, they're nothing short of remarkable. Uh, we see it as an opportunity for Visa. Uh, I believe that we can help build on the financial inclusion that has happened as a result of UPI and help turn that into financial empowerment. Mm -hmm help work with the banks in India, help work with the ecosystem in India to create new credit products, to help people grow up the credit ladder, help them build wealth, help empower them financially as a result of the great work that's happened with UPI in India. So given the fact that you believe that UPI presents itself as an opportunity and not necessarily merely as competition, you know, what's the target that you've set for the India team? Uh, what's the plan in terms of incremental investments, in terms of expansion? As I pointed out, you've got, what, about 4,000 employees here working in India, largely sitting out of your Bengaluru uh, spaces, your Bengaluru offices. What was all of this going to mean now as far as Visa's future expansion in India? Yeah, well, first, I'm so proud of our team here. Our team in Bengaluru, our, our team in Mumbai, um, they are every day coming into work, serving our clients, serving our partners, and doing everything that they can do to not only help build new innovations for India, but increasingly to build products and services that we can export from India all around the world. Mm. We feel just so proud and so great about the team that we have here. I'll tell you, I leave India thinking I need to set the targets higher set the targets higher, not for just the investment that we make as a company, but also the results that we expect of our team here. So I'll definitely take that back uh, from my trip. And, you know, we just, we, we have been in this country for 40 years. Yeah. When we're thinking about the opportunities in this country, we're thinking about the next 40 years and the next 40 years after that. Those are the time frames we're thinking about in terms of the investments that we're making in the country. Well, let, let's talk about the next five years, not the next 40 years, because we don't know what's going to happen in the next 40 years. So uh, over the next five years, in terms of the opportunities that you spoke of and in terms of focus areas that you intend to double down on, remittances, cross-border, uh, you know, how is Visa going to operate in those spaces? How do you intend to leverage the advantages there? 
Yeah, first of all, um, if you just step back for all of the success that you and I have been talking about with the digitization of payments in India, there's still more than a trillion dollars in cash. So we're not spent. a cashless so, economy by any measure. So, so we still have an opportunity to partner and to work to help digitize that cash. But then building on kind of the, the consumer payments that you and I make every day, there's enormous opportunities in B2B payments, mm. in government payments. There's an enormous opportunity in transit systems. We've been involved in more than 750 transit systems around the world, helping them operate more official, efficiently by digitizing the payments. And then as you said, we see remittances as a tremendous opportunity. We've built out a platform, we call it Visa Direct, where we have 8.5 billion endpoints, cards, accounts, digital wallets all around the world. And what we're doing is we're putting that platform to work to make remittances in and out of India and all over the world, but this is the biggest corridor for remittances in the world, make them more transparent, make them faster, make them cheaper, make it a better user experience for both the sender and the receiver. And we think that's a tremendous opportunity for us to continue to help and add value here in India. You know, you, you talked about uh, the fact that cash continues to be a significant part of the economy, uh, while digitization has, of course, grown as well. But you know, when just before the UPI actually took over and took off quite literally, uh, the view was that this could potentially mean the death of credit cards. That was the expectation. It hasn't quite turned out that way. But how do you see the credit card space evolving in terms of form factors, in terms of features, in terms of innovation? What do you see as the next wave of disruption to the credit card itself? Yeah, what we've seen around the world is users choose to pay with credit in different ways. Sometimes it's a card, sometimes it's a plastic card, sometimes it's a metal card, but increasingly it's a digital tokenized incarnation of the card. That can be on your phone or different form factors. So our strategy the whole time has been not to be wed to a card per se. In many ways we've unbundled credit from what we all think of as the legacy card and we've embedded that credit in the user experiences that people have as they're working their way through their digital experiences or as we were talking about earlier in the physical world. And increasingly the physical world and digital world are, are blending. So um, we very much have unbundled those capabilities and we do think that there's a lot we can bring to India in terms of innovative products and services in credit specifically that we've seen in different parts of the world. Um, you know, in many ways, the, the credit product itself uh, has, has um, melded and evolved in ways that it's embedded in people's lives in ways that it, it almost becomes invisible. Mm. And that's when you start to really empower that purchasing power in a, in a way that's great for small businesses and merchants. You know, you talked about financial empowerment and you also brought up the issue of the credit gaps and the credit gaps exist in many spaces in different degrees. What will be the focus as far as bridging the credit gap specifically from an Indian consumer or an Indian markets perspective? bringing new um, solutions to help underwrite near um, prime credit, new to credit, young credit customers, um, working with banks uh, to provide different types of line management services, different types of um, uh, ways to segment credit and make them applicable in certain use cases. All of this type of innovation is happening uh, around the world and I think is going to be a great opportunity to build on, as we were saying earlier, the momentum that's happened with UPI and, you know, in five years, to come back to the question from a couple, uh, a few moments ago, maybe we don't even call it a credit card yeah. per se. Maybe we call it Visa credit or maybe we call it, um, you know, who knows what we call it. The, the word card may, may drop from our lexicon in India given the enormous uh, progress that's happened here. But we view our role as someone who can help power that innovation for banks across India. You know, you're talking about innovation, so uh, uh, we can't not talk about what's happening as far as the world of AI is concerned. And Visa, for those of you who, who might not be aware, has decided to put together a war chest of $100 million to uh, look at nurturing uh, AI across different startups. Take me through the idea behind that, what you intend to do. Uh, is that going to be a focus area for you here in India as well? Yeah, sure. Let me, I'll talk about that specifically and then more broadly how we're thinking about generative AI. That idea specifically came from a set of experiences where we were looking for companies that were using generative AI to create new commerce experiences and we weren't able to find a lot of them. 
We wanted to go find them and nurture them, and we have a program we call FinTrack Fast Track, bring them onto the Visa platform. And so we said, why don't we put together an investment fund so that we can help go find some of those entrepreneurs, those people that are dreaming big about how they could use generative AI to transform commerce, and why don't we invest in them? And so that's where we, we started on that journey. If I back up, we're big believers in the power of AI. We've been a leader in AI for 30 years, using predictive AI to build our products and services, secure our network. Uh, we've been very aggressive in adopting generative AI in our company. We've made all of the tools and co-pilots available to our employees around the world. How much have you invested on that side? Oh, I, I, I couldn't give you the number, but if you went and talked to any one of our employees in India around the world and said, tell me about what Ryan's been talking to you about. In generative terms AI. <laughs> the, the, there's, he's on us. Every, every team in Visa is expected to have a roadmap and a plan of how they're using generative AI to make their function more, more effective and more efficient. Finance, HR, products, obviously technology. So the use technology. case at this point in time, efficiency and effectiveness, right? So it, it is, it's about efficiency and effectiveness, but I think the real magic, the real magic is when we're able to bring new products to market using generative AI. I'll give you an example. Um, we, uh, we have been using generative AI to take our transaction data and create what we call synthetic data sets. And what we're able to do with synthetic data sets is take the same fraud, risk, and cyber capabilities yeah. we've used on the Visa network and use those to identify fraud on real-time payment networks. And we found that we can identify scams and fraud using the same data and analytics from our experience in, in card payments and apply that to account to account payments and real time payments, all because we have generative AI to create these new synthetic data sets and these new analytic tools. You know, uh, let me just stick with that. Given what's happening in the Indian fintech space specifically uh, on the startup side, is that, is that something that you're looking at closely? Does anything excite you there? Uh, are we likely to see you fund anything on that side? Yeah, we've, um, we've been, first of all, what I, what's happened in India in the fintechs and startup space is extraordinary. Um, we partner with most, if not all of them, to help them. Uh, we've invested in uh, several of them here in India. I'm looking for more generative AI commerce uh, companies, so if you find any as part of this conference, please let me know. We're looking to invest in them. That, that's, that's the pitch. So if anyone's watching this, the global CEO of Visa is on the lookout uh, for Indian fintechs who are focused on the generative AI space. Hopefully you'll start to get a lot of people writing into you, Ryan. That would, that would, that would make me extremely happy. <laughs> Well, you know, uh, since we're talking about fintech, let's talk about regulation in India. Uh, the regulator has done many things, uh, including data localization, which was brought in a couple of years ago. Of course, all of you need to be compliant with that. There have been some recent changes for credit cards specifically. How do you see the regulatory environment in India at this point in time? Is it challenging? Does it add friction? Or is it making you feel that it is securing the digital payment ecosystem? Of course it can be challenging at times, but it makes us better. Uh, that's how we view it. We want to be in compliance as effective and faster than any company in our space. We want the regulators to look at Visa as a leader. Uh, and we lean into this regulation because we do believe that it makes us better. I also give enormous credit to the regulators in India for leading the charge on innovations that not only um, make the, the system more safe, they help drive commerce. I would use uh, tokenization as an example. I think the regulators in India leaned into tokenization, they mandated tokenization, and as a result, e-commerce is going to be adopted even faster in India. It's going to be safer, it's going to be more secure, it's going to have higher authorization So you're saying rates. that the regulator in India was uh, ahead of the curve on tokenization? Absolutely. They were an innovator in that way of leading, it, it, as far as all the regulators in the world, by mandating tokenization for e-commerce in India. Mm -hmm. Uh, so what would you say are the key risks today? Uh, you know, what keeps you up at night? You were talking about uh, cyber safety, cyber security, and in general, what we've seen with the um, momentum of digital transactions going up, that we've also seen the risks of digital fraud, of cyber risks, and so on and so forth. How are you, uh, A, within Visa, uh, trying to fortify yourself, and how much of this is a risk that you're factoring in? It's, a, it's an enormous priority for us. I think it's a very big risk. You know, at the core of digital payments, at the core of the success of digital payments is trust. All of us 
are very comfortable engaging in digital payments, whether it's with a Visa card or anything else, because we trust that it's going to be safe. And we take the responsibility to safeguard our network and ensure that it's the safest and most reliable network very seriously. As you might expect, we're a very big target for uh, the bad guys that are out there. Um, we have uh, somewhere between... Average, how, how much do you get attacked in a day? I was just about to say, we, we are attacked somewhere between 400 and 500 million times a month. Attack vectors that come from all different parts of the world. I'll give you another, another example. Uh, as a, we have about 30,000 employees. Every month we stop 20 million emails that were meant to be sent to our employees, and we stop them before they get to them. All of those are from bad actors. They're trying to trick our employees into doing something that they otherwise shouldn't do. Um, so we take that very seriously. We've invested billions in our cybersecurity protections. We have a 1,000 people that come into work every day, and all they do is focus on our cyber protections. But beyond that, we're also creating tools for our bank partners mm. to help them stop fraud. Yeah. Every year, through those tools, we stop more than $30 billion of fraud that otherwise would have been perpetrated on our network and with our, our customers' clients. So this is, this, this is going to be an arms race. It's going to continue to be an arms race, and we are going to invest, and we're going we're gonna to work as hard as we possibly can to stay one step, if not five steps ahead of the bad actors to ensure that the network is as safe and secure as it possibly can be. You know, when you say that this is going to be an arms race, explain to me uh, how you're going about it. I mean, putting money at the problem or throwing money at the problem is just one aspect, but how are you thinking about this strategically? And more importantly, how do you look at this from your partner's perspective as well, who may not be, may not have the ability to throw money at the problem? Well, first on the second part of your question, this is something I've been talking to um, everyone that I've had a chance to meet with while I've been in India. We want to protect our network, the Visa network, with all of the tools and security that I mentioned, but we also want to make these tools available to all networks. We want to make our services available to any, any network that's out there because, let's be honest, like all of the, the network of networks that we operate in across the world, um, and on this particular topic, we're all in this together. Mm. We need to be investing in the safety and security of digital payments so that everybody across the world continues to trust. So MasterCard and you are aligned on this one. I, listen, <laughs> I, I, I think cyber protection is existential for digital payments, and so I want to make sure that we're making our products, our services, our talent, we're sharing information, we're sharing our services to anyone that's interested in putting them to work, and you know we feel like we have great... Uh, products and services that we can be helpful with. Yeah, I want to go back to something that you said right at the very beginning. You said that you're here in India to learn. Uh, and in the context of the digital public infrastructure and what India has been able to do with the India stack, it was a big part of our pitch to the world uh, through our G20 presidency as well. What do you see as the opportunities to export the India stack uh, to the world? Yeah, I th first of all, I think the world is paying very close attention to it. I think there is a meaningful opportunity to export the stack. Uh, I mean, just you go through it. Aadhaar, UPI, um, ONDC, DigiLocker. I mean, all of these elements of the stack are extraordinarily impressive. I was saying to, to my team the other day, I think if you look at what India has done and you look at the product roadmap, I would put it up against any of the best big tech players on the planet. Not just the roadmap itself, um, the clarity, the execution, the, the, the transparency, um, the length of the roadmap. Um, it, is, it is remarkable execution, and I think there is a big opportunity to export uh, the stack uh, far beyond India. Well, what do you think it will take for us to be able to do that in terms of prioritization, in terms of strategic choices? You know, if, if you were to sort of uh, put together a roadmap of how we take it forward, what would that entail? I, I think at a foundation is a public-private partnership. Um, you know, we view ourselves as a potential partner. Um, and, you know, I think what's, what's proven, if you look over time, with the adoption of uh, similar types of things around the world, it's the public-private partnership at work. And, you know, I think this is an area where uh, India's leadership, as you said, coming out of the G20, um, making the world more aware of the stack and the impact that it's had, 
um, is a big first step. And you know, I think engaging with governments, engaging with the private sector, companies like Visa, and through public-private partnership, that should be a great way to expand those things. Let's talk about what's happening globally as well, Ryan. Uh, clearly, you're confident about the India growth story, the macros as well as what's happening as far as the digital side of the story is concerned. But global, uh, you know, the, the uh, macros continue to look challenging at this point in time. The expectation of a cut coming in from the Fed in June, perhaps less likely today. Japan's just raised interest rates. What are consumer trends telling you in terms of spending power, spending capacity, and the possibility of uh, the current trends holding up? Despite everything that you said, the consumer spending around the world remains resilient. It remains stable. If you look at the year-over-year -year growth in transactions or payment volume uh, across our network and in most of the countries in which we operate, uh, it's been relatively stable. That's a really good news, despite mm. everything you said. Now, of course, higher interest rates are, are, are taking a dent out of consumers. Um, consumers are changing their purchasing patterns, uh, the mix they of buying? things they buy. What, what are they spending most of their money on today? Well, it's, it's actually coming now having, um, with COVID a couple years in the rearview mirror, uh, we've rebalanced pretty close to where we were in the mix of goods and services pre-COVID with a bit more shift towards services, travel, entertainment, yeah. Taylor Swift concerts, <laughs> uh, things like that. Um, so I think that's, you, a whole, that's a whole other economy, we, isn't it? The Taylor Swift economy is a whole other economy. It's incredible, <laughs> isn't it? It's incredible. Um, but you know, going back to your first question, it, the consumer remains resilient. Listen, there, there's, there's pockets around the world. Um, in some markets where, for example, you've got more variable rate mortgages. Australia is a good example. UK is a good example. Consumers are having to spend more of their discretionary spending or non-discretionary spending on, on mortgages, and we see that coming out of spending. But on the other side, um, we see travel in and out of China picking up. We see travel uh, into the United States picking up. So international travel um, is, is very much still on the rebound. So overall stable with some, some puts and takes in different places. You know, you talked about uh, regional differences in the way that uh, resilience is showing up. And, and you're on your way out of India, you're, you're going to be headed into China. So let's address that issue as well. Uh, the recovery is underway, but patchy. Uh, there are concerns on what is happening as far as the real estate sector in China is concerned and whether that poses a systemic risk. How do you see China at this point in time, both in terms of recovery as well as in terms of consumer confidence? Yeah, um, in, in terms of China, we again, we think about it in five, 10 year, 15 year increments. Uh, there's no question that you know, the Chinese economy is going through some bumps right now, but there too, we view it as our role to be as helpful as we possibly can, um, to invest in the tools and the capabilities to help the, the banks and the broader economy do well. Um, and you know, China's a, a very large economy with a lot of power, and I think when you think five, 10, and 15 years out, uh, it's gonna be a big opportunity as well. So as a global CEO, uh, what, what, what do you map on your dashboard? I mean, outside of what's happening inside of Visa, what are the factors that uh, you have on your dashboard as potential risks or potential opportunities today? Geopolitics has, of course, emerged as one of the big concerns, given just the volatile state of play. But uh, you know, what are you looking at? What are the various factors that you're looking at? No, it's, it's, I mean, um, geopolitics is always an issue. You and I were talking beforehand about the, the enormous number of elections that are happening this year. So from that, there's going to be change. There's always change. Um, but, you know, I, I'm very optimistic, very optimistic of the opportunities around the world. Um, you know, coming out of the elections, I think there's an enormous kind of road in front of us. And, you know, I'm hopeful that the economy can continue to have the great success that it has. And, you know, hopefully we can be a, a part of that. You know, the other thing that I spend a lot of time on is consumer preferences, consumer trends. What are, what are we hearing from buyers and sellers around the world? What do they need? What are the technologies that are changing, um, you know, how they're running their businesses or they're engaging in, in their lives? Uh, by the way, generative AI, um, another topic we could talk about as helpful is how I think it's going to change shopping, which mm. I think it'll have a very big impact More on experiential? That. Yeah, I think um, it's... You know, it's just going to make it easier. You know, if you think about um, shopping, for, especially for someone like myself, who's neither that good at it nor likes it that much, um, it's very inefficient. That, that makes the two of us. It, it's, <laughs> it's, it's relatively inefficient. Um, and so I think generative AI, all of us are going to have co-pilots in terms of shopping. We're going to have much more curated experiences. We're going to have much more curated payment experiences that come with it. Um, and that's just going to make a much better experience. I, I also think... Um, 
I have a personal thesis that generative AI could be a very empowering capability for small businesses around the world. Mm -hmm. It starts to give them access to the capabilities that only the largest retailers have had, whether it's product reviews mm -hmm. or recommendation engines or things like that become unbundled and available to small and medium businesses around the world. I think generative AI could be a very leveling force in the commerce space. You, you preempted what I was going to say. So you actually believe the generative AI will level the playing field, not make the gaps wider? I believe it will. That's my personal thesis. I think, um, I think it'll, it'll, for the largest retailers and the largest platforms, it will certainly help optimize what they do. Um, and it, again, make a more enjoyable experience for all of us as shoppers. Uh, but I think it has the power to level the playing field, it has the power to democratize a lot of the commerce capabilities that have been bundled into some of the largest platforms and make them available. And for you and I as shoppers, I think we're going to have much more broad views to inventory that's available in small and medium businesses either in the cities that we live in or, or around us. Mm -hmm. You know, so who do you consider as competition today in a fintech world, in an AI-led world where every phone company wants to be a fintech player, uh, you know, every big tech company wants to be in the banking business as well in some shape or form or in the payments business? What, what does the competitive landscape look like today for you? I'll tell you, over the last several years, um, you know, the, the, the early narrative on fintechs was, you know, th they're going to be competitive for the payment system. We saw it differently. We saw all of these players as potential partners. And that's very much how we see it today. FinTech, Big Tech, Little Tech, Small Tech. We view all of them as potential partners for Visa. And we view it as an opportunity to put our network to work to help them grow their business and ultimately meet whatever goal it is that they've set out for themselves. And I think uh, if you go today, for example, down in, in Silicon Valley near where I live, and you talk to FinTechs, you'll find most, if not all of them, Visa has become their most important partner. And so that, that's, that's how we see the world. We see the world um, in terms of partners and people that we can put our network to work, open our network, make it available, and help them achieve whatever it is the goal that they're trying to achieve. You know, you said that uh, uh, you see fintechs as potential collaborators, potential partners as well. You also said earlier on that Perhaps in the future at some point, you may just drop card altogether as part of the sort of proposition that you offer to consumers because, you know, you're digital in, in many ways. So what do you see Visa being? I mean, in terms of your core DNA, how do you see that core DNA evolving and changing given the many uh, changes that we are seeing in the ecosystem? What could that potentially mean over the next five to ten years? Yeah, at our core, we're a network. We're the safest, most secure most reliable, largest payment network on the planet with the largest reach. And the way we're evolving that is building out from not just being the Visa network to being a network of networks. And that's what we want to do. We want to be able to enable money movement across all networks around the, the, the world. Um, you know, we were talking about remittances and that Visa Direct platform that, that I mentioned to you earlier, we move money across ACH systems we move money across RTP systems. We move money across other card networks. Again, all in service of giving our clients the biggest, most reliable, safest, most secure money movement platform on the planet. So that, that's how we think about our role. And we, we very much are an open network. We want anyone to build on us. Whatever they can dream up, the products, the services that they can dream up, they know that they have the Visa network available to them to put their products and services to work. So do you see India then being an incubator of some of the innovations that you would hope for Visa to focus on in the future? An innovator, an exporter, um, there's no question about it. I mean, the fintech community here has had a very profound impact on Visa. Um, and, you know, we've, we've collaborated, we've worked with them. How has it changed Visa? How, how have Indian fintechs changed Visa? Yeah, Indian fintechs have opened up our mind to the power of QR payments. So now we're looking at other markets around the world where QR might be the form factor that users prefer, buyers and sellers. So, well, okay, we don't need cards. We'll use QR, and that'll be the form factor that will then allow people to tap into uh, the Visa network, as an example. And that, that very much came from the inspiration of what we've seen happen here in India. So, you know, speaking of inspiration, uh, Again, uh, Ryan, of course, has been with Visa for about 11 years now. Uh, 
held many jobs before that, but has been CEO for almost a year now. Uh, uh, Feb is when you, when you uh, completed a year as CEO. Uh, you know, as, as CEO, managing people is, of course, an important aspect of your job as well, and especially when you manage people across 200 different countries. It's a complex job as well. Uh, how, do you, how do you make sure that there is an alignment of purpose, that there is an alignment of vision uh, as you operate across 200 different jurisdictions? Yeah, in terms of uh, alignment, um, I find it's about clear communication, um, always on communication, and just being, being able to listen and learn uh, from our employees around the world about what's working well, what's not working well, and how we can help them do their jobs better. You know, we, um, when I get back uh, to the US in a week or so, we're gonna move into a new office. Um, uh, we actually call it our market support center, not corporate headquarters. We call it the Visa Market Support Center. So if you ever come visit, you'll see that on the building. Um, and I, I want people, when they come into work every day, to remember that we are serving our markets around the world. We're serving India. We're serving Brazil. We're serving England and Germany. And I want our employees to just remember that is our job every day, to listen, to learn, and to ultimately be in service of our markets around the world so that they can serve their clients and they can do the great things that they need to do here in India and around the world. So is there, is there a Ryan specific way of, of A, getting feedback and B, incorporating feedback into driving change? Yeah, I, um, I try to be as approachable and open as I possibly can. Um, I, for example, um, I just, uh, actually on the flight over here, um, I just uh, launched a new um, internal social media platform. Think about it that way. And I regularly am now gonna start posting what I'm thinking, my ideas. I actually posted some pictures from my, from experience, from in my experience in Mumbai um, to all of our employees around the world. I showed them how the sound box works. I showed them how the QR code works. And, and I encourage them to ask me questions on the platform, give me feedback on the platform. Um, sometimes they'll just comment on, you know, uh, you know did, you, did you drink the coffee that you bought? Um, but I've started to get really good feedback on that channel, even just a week in. So I just try to be as approachable as I possibly can, um, as open as I possibly can to our team members, to ask them for feedback, to encourage them for feedback, to reward them when they give me feedback, and then do our best to incorporate that into our strategy, what we're doing, and then back to your original question, just be as clear and concise in, in communicating that out to our team as I possibly can be. So since you said that one of the things that you focus on is being clear and concise and communicating your message to the team, I'm gonna end by asking you the message that you're sending or leaving your India team with. You said that you're gonna probably up the targets given the opportunities and the potential that you see in India. What's the message to the India team on how they should leverage the India opportunity? India is an enormous opportunity India's had incredible success. We are here to partner. We want to be an integral part of the India story. We want to put the visa network to work in every way that we possibly can to help accelerate the progress in India, help move from financial inclusion to financial empowerment. And you know, I, I'm going to give our team all the resources they need to do that. And they haven't given you a number just yet. <laughs> they've given me some numbers. They've given you some numbers. Are you going to do better than the numbers that they've left you with? We're going to give them everything they need to be successful. Well, Ryan, thank you very, very much for joining us here. Ladies and gentlemen, the global CEO of Visa on their outlook for India, as well as the opportunities that it presents for the Visa Network. Appreciate you joining us. We hope you have a fabulous trip back, and we look forward to seeing you back in India soon. It was fun talking to you. Thank, thank you very you much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you once again, Ryan. Thank you, Shireen. That was indeed a fascinating conversation. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, just a quick reminder, we do have a very exciting evening lined up for you. So